Good afternoon and welcome to another version of Hunt, Capture, and Win, a trademark webinar series that Jimmy Baker and I at Salzburg developed to present different aspects of the federal marketplace and how to be successful. Um, we, we're focusing this year and in this webinar on the, the, the 2015 government technology marketplace. And we're going to take a little bit different spin into th this session. Uh, we're going to cover things that uh, Jimmy and I are both really expert at, which is where to find the money. Uh, we're going to start with a snapshot of the federal, state, and local marketplace. Uh, we're going to demonstrate how to research your customer, where to start, how to actually use the public information to to determine where where money is being spent. We're going to show you how to leverage intelligence into a new a new marketplace of business and understanding strategies that really are effective with your company and then move with your with your customer and then move into tactics, uh, key performance indicators, and if we have time, proposal strategies. Um, um, I want to thank Smart Procure, uh, who's one of our sponsors, and also the third presenter. Uh, Jack Siney is here from Smart Procure, and I'll explain what they do briefly in just a second. Uh, Jack will go into a little more details, and uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Baker uh, and his public sector marketing organization, where he, where he does a lot of online and face-to-face and, and, um, and -face events that bring government contractors and, and government officials together. And um, ERS Advisors, my company in which um, I work on procurement and pipeline management. I want to introduce Jimmy just briefly. Uh, Jimmy is, a, is an author and a, and, a, and a noted speaker on the subject of of uh, strategic approaches to growing uh, government business. Uh, he, and he focuses really heavily on the strategic part of defining your marketplace and getting yourself up in front of the right customers who are buying what you're, what you're doing. And he's one of the world's experts, really one of the leading experts, in using public information to define that market and really identify the opportunities. He's also the author of one of the best books around, How to Win Business from the Federal Government and that's a book that I use all the time and many of the techniques that Jimmy talks about are in that book. Uh, he and I are collaborating on a second version of it to really bring it up to date and we'll talk about that just a little bit more. Jack Siney is here and he's the uh, Chief uh, Operating Officer for Smart Procure. He has a really a great government background um, working here in Washington and then also uh, across the country and he's one of the uh, original founders of Smart Procure and they take a much different spin into the marketplace of business intelligence than you hear from the firms who are just tracking procurements. I think you'll find the way his company provides business intelligence services to government contractors really eye-opening as a new approach to identify who's buying what specifically in your areas of expertise. And my background is working as a senior officer in some of the largest and most successful companies in the business. Um, and then I started my own company uh, several years ago to provide uh, tactical and operational strategic um, of support to government contractors. Um, as I mentioned, we're coming out with a new book which is combining the front end of identifying where the business is, which is what Jimmy does, to the back end of this, which is how to actually get yourself positioned to win and managing your pipeline to meet your financial goals. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Jimmy Baker, uh, who's going to start out with a look at 2015 and work through that agenda that, uh, that we just showed you. Jimmy? Thank you very much. And uh, before we get started, I want to thank all of you for taking time in your busy schedule to join Ed and Jack and myself. And I think what you'll find at the end of the day, what it really boils down to, is your company has to take this data and you have to go market it, you have to go knock on doors, and you have to go make proposals. And what we're hoping to show you some techniques, but before we get cooking, I want to talk to you, uh, I'm going to give you a quick snapshot on the federal budget, and I'll also say this. Um, I spend a great deal of time, and Jack's going to talk on this in a moment, in the state and local markets. No matter what marketplace I'm in, no matter whom I'm speaking with, the issue in government right now is security one, cloud second, mobile citizen the third. And you know things, buzzwords like big data and uh, collaboration all go around those things, but we're seeing that, and you'll see some data here in a moment that also supports it. So, 
Everything begins with the federal budget, and I have a picture of that on the screen. And what we're going to talk about here is how you access the budget. Um, bear with me just a moment. I'm getting my bearings here with using the uh, to online tools. So when you go to access the, the, the actual government budget, what you want to do is go out to the itdashboard.gov. I'm going to show you a technique and a case study in a little bit of how you actually do this. Here's the good news. In the federal IT sector, the budget's $72.8 billion, of which there is $689 million of new money or D&E. That's a big deal. And even though our market is down a negative 2.9% uh, uh, from the year before, that's actually because the government has been doing what it's been preaching. They're doing more or less and saving cost. And I hear that rhetoric through the many C-level executives that I talk to throughout the year. They're looking to find savings in their programs and apply them elsewhere. You can read the rest of that, but that's where we get the budget. Now, let's take a little bit more look at what's, what's big with federal government this year and, and coming up. Three big things, and like I said, uh, Jack's going to hit on this a little bit. Uh, any article you pick up, these are the big issues in government. Innovation through the cloud. Deliver, uh, delivery through maximizing IT value and investment. Advancing the nation's cybersecurity. We are all living in a world where Target and Home Depot have been attacked, where we all do business. Um, it's coming after us in other areas, and the security threat is very real, and we're seeing that more and more in the different uh, circles of government that I travel in. Now, I actually read the entire federal IT budget for you, so you don't have to. It's 4,808 lines. It's a massive spreadsheet. And uh, takes a lot of time to do it. But what I've done, I've actually gone through it, and I've highlighted all the deals that are over $10 million in revenue. Um, doesn't mean the deals below that aren't good. I just went with the big ticket items of what they're investing in. You may read this list for yourself, but I guarantee that your company has something to do with one of these areas, and the government's buying and spending in it. Now, last thing we're going to talk about is what does this really mean to your company? Bottom line, it's a target-rich environment for next year. And what I'm going to show you a little bit later in the presentation is how, um, how you can literally do a budget and go through it. And I'm sorry, Ed, forgive me. I think I may have made a uh, faux pas here. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go with uh, the, the federal case study right now. I know we switched some things at the last minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, folks. So let me shift back a gears. So that's an overview of the federal marketplace. Jack's going to talk to you about the state and local and show you how to use research on that. But uh, what we're going to do in the next 10 minutes is I'm going to take you through very quickly how you literally research an agency, look at the budget, look at their strategy guides, understand their business case, the competition, create what I call a run rate. That's just a, a compiling of all your data to make a sales forecast of what you're going to do. Long before I ever wrote a book, long before I ever became a consultant, I was a quota carrying salesperson. I was a director of business development, so I've had to you know, practice what I'm preaching here. We're going to go through that in the next few minutes. Now, some of the information will be, will be going through fast and quick. You can always uh, talk to me outside the webinar. We'll have our contact information up. And by the way, I'm going to give you a federal case study Many of this parallels uh, the same with state and local government. I work in a lot of areas uh, across the country, and you can find similar data. So let's begin with a federal case study. One of the biggest problems that I see when I go and talk with people is they don't understand their federal customer. Um, many times people are still in the mindset of what we do, what our features and benefits are, but at the end of the day, when you begin to take on a federal or state entity or a big county, you have to look at them as a large corporation that has divisions and subdivisions. You know, it's department, agency, office. And many times we don't think of like, oh, I'm just going to sell to Department of Justice or the state of California. These are huge entities. They're organized in a way. They have strategies and plans. And I have up on the screen, and you can read this for yourself. Look at the Department of Justice. It's made up of 40 different components. So, you know, if you want to sell the DOJ, 
you know, kudos to you, but who and where? Um, let's just take a closer look at what I mean by that. These are the organizations within uh, Department of Justice, and we're going to talk later in the presentation, but generally, in any given federal department or agency, there's usually 15 to 30 vertical markets that are working in place, and you may have to develop a verticalized message to a specific office, and we'll deal with that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, as I said, it's very important to know how an organization is structured. Uh, as you deal with civilian agencies, the, the, the structure of leadership is different than military, but the bottom line is there's always going to be a couple people that have to sign off on a deal that take orders from someone within a hierarchy of the organization. And sometimes when you hit objections, you need to understand how to go around or move through an organization. So, you know, one, understand the organization, get a hold of the org chart. The next thing you want to look at, and like I said, from federal to state groups, is you want to understand what are their strategy initiatives? What is important to them? Because what happens at the high levels of government is they make plans for the next several years. And they say, hey, this is the stuff that's of huge value to us that we've got to make sure we execute on. And if you're knocking on the door and you're saying things like, I'm an 8A hub zone, woman-owned SDB, they're not going to answer that. But if you're knocking on the door and you say, listen, I've looked at the budget, and you have this amount in DME funding to handle this strategic connect initiative, and we've done that here, you're going to get much greater results. You can read DOJ's strategic initiatives, but the point is here, whomever you're calling on, make sure you understand that. Budgets are very important. Um, I have watched many people lose a job because they followed a deal that wasn't funding. The takeaway for me on this is always, 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 and I'll add one more always and always, make sure a deal is funded. Too many times people can forecast stuff, but it's not funded. You begin looking at the budget. You want to read the general budget, which highlights what's going on in a group. I have links there on the screen right now that you can get to access to that. And then after that, you want to go over to the tech budget. Now, when you're looking at the IT budget, you go in through the IT dashboard. What I want you all to do is once you download the IT budget, like I said, it's this big, giant Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, you need to make a list of what your company does. Now, and I, I don't want to um, make this sound as easy as it is. When I do this for clients, I spend a month going through the budget identifying opportunities for them. But what you, your senior management, your business development team should be doing is going through the budget and literally making a short list of what you do. And you can use a Command F, Control F feature and search for those deals that are germane to your organization. That's why you create the short list there. And that's a great way to find out what deals are important to you. Now, when you're moving from the budget, what you want to incorporate is what I call a run rate. All that is is we're going to take the budget, and we're just going to say, hey, the government's got $500 to spend on widgets. Here it is, and we're going to make a way to get access to that. So pull up a copy of the budget look at, and look at the differences between O&M, which is their steady state spending, and that word DME, Development, Modernization, and Enhancement. That's the new money. And what you want to guide when you're going through a federal budget, and I think we have a picture of it here coming up, is this is how you do the control feature. And then what you want to look for when you're doing a budget, and you'll see the screen in a moment. I have a couple columns highlighted. You want to highlight the steady state spending versus the DME. And here's why. And this is a really strong takeaway. We have over a couple hundred companies on the phone today listening to today's webcast. Um, some of you are a five-people company, <clears throat> where others are 25 people, others are 150. The issue is this. The government awards contracts based on their view of risk. If you're a five-person company, you can't go after 10 and $30 million deals. You're just not going to get awarded them. You've got to go after, you know, usually 25 persons, about two and a half million, a little bit less. But you want to go after work that you can handle, so the government will say, there is no risk associating giving this contract. So here's what you're looking for. You're looking for deals that have new money flowing into them. The piece of gold in all this 
is finding a new budget line item that has no funding in the past and it's all DME. That means it's brand spanking new. That's your uh, proverbial low-hanging fruit. The other thing you want to look at in this is you want to look at deals that have steady spending over the last three years. What that tells you is that these are opportunities that you can go and chase and they have a steady line of spending. This is, uh, there's a lot more that we could talk about this. Um, Ed and I just taught a class at the University of Maryland together where I spent over an hour going into this. Um, we have some training videos that go into deeper dives on how you do this. It's a lot of work. After you get doing through that, what you next want to do is take it, you want to add a column on your spreadsheet for what your value is to the government. So many people don't know that. What's your unique selling proposition? You want to literally um, understand that and at the end of the day be able to tell them. Uh, the last thing I think that we're going to scratch on, and then I'm going to summarize and we'll move over to Jack, is that as you're making this spreadsheet of deals that you're going to chase, so you're going to, let me just back it up a gear, summarize, and then I'll wrap up. Download the budget. Literally pull the budget of a, of a targeted department that you're going to go after and make that your spreadsheet for your team to go chase. You're first going to shortlist what you do, you're going to look through, you're going to try to find the steady state dollars versus the DME, and then you're going to add a few columns to it. You're going to, one, add a column for the mission and goals of the department. I'm going to tell you why that's important. Next, you're going to add a column for any RFPs. Jack's going to talk in a moment. Smart Procure is a great way to look at RFPs. Um, you're also going to add a column for the business case. I don't have time today, but you need to know the 300 or business case associated with any deal you chase. You want to add a column for um, any um, people that are involved in the deal that you need to go talk to. You want to look at who the incumbent might be. And ultimately, at the end of this, you want to have a waiting column where you go through and you look at the time, the size of the deal, and your value, and you make an assessment, you know? Do we do this or not? And I, in my book, I get into details about how you can wait deals. So that is a very fast uh, snapshot. And again, the idea is to go from the theoretical to say, hey, the government's funding this. They're going to buy it. We do it. And we need to go and talk to them. Our marketing department needs to market to them. And our proposal needs to write a proposal that supports that we can do this. I'll be available for questions in the back of the presentation. And if we have time today before I turn it over to Jack, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, some things about marketing and branding. With that, it is my pleasure to uh, hand the reins over to Jack Siney. Jack is a wealth of information. He has a very strong background with the Navy. Um, if you don't know a lot about Smart Procure, let me just say this, folks. They're different than the traditional uh, you know, uh, sources out there. You want to pay attention to them. It's a very neat product and why Ed and I are associating ourselves with them. So with that, I'm going to mute my line. Jack, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. And uh, for everyone on the call, I definitely appreciate your time and your focus on what we're doing. And I promise to be brief and hopefully very, very direct to help you grow your business um, next year as you think about, hey, what opportunities should we go after in the government market? And so most of you already know this, right? Uh, Jim already went over it. The market next year is about $6.5 trillion, depending on how you slice it. If you include state and local, there's 89,000 different government agencies. And the interesting part is when folks say, hey, sometimes I don't have the time or energy to go after the government. It takes a longer period of time. The real point on the screen is obviously the government can be your biggest prospect no matter what vertical market you're in, right, which is pretty significant. We decide, hey, where are we going to spend our time and energy? So as a quick overview of the state and local market, Smart Procure is not a forecasting uh, tool, but our, as you look at exploring what opportunities to pursue, you'll see down in the middle of the slide the state and local uh, opportunities represent about half of all government spending. And so this year they anticipate that the state and local spending will increase about 25 to 3.5%. That could go higher if the economy recovers at a higher rate or a faster rate, or if some of the health care changes have a bigger impact than folks uh, are forecasting. The, from an IT perspective, they anticipate that going up about 3.5% uh, each year up to 2019. And the biggest thing, when the sequestration and some of the other challenges in the federal level began to occur over the last year or so, folks started to look at the state and local market maybe that hadn't previously. And so 
that's great, but the market and the, uh, the number of organizations to look at are much bigger. So it really begs this question, great, state and local is half of all government spending, but there's so many more agencies, I can't just stay within the beltway. How in the heck do I find the agencies that are buying the most of what I offer, right? It's like the $64 million question. And so really that's what Smart Procure focuses his time and energy on. Uh, Jim had mentioned earlier this issue of big data. and So that's a hot topic in both the government and the private sector today. But in the government world, on the right side of your screen, you see a purchase order, a sample purchase order. And the unique part about the government, obviously, is that they they're share that data. They share that data with their constituents. And so there's a lot of information on that purchase order document. So this data set allows folks to, to gain a lot of information. The challenge is, hey, how do I get all of the data for a particular city, much less thousands of city uh, across the country. And so that's really where Smart Procure targets our efforts. And so um, I'm just trying to click the slide. So if somebody could click the slide for me, that'd be great. So it's a proprietary data set. Um, so Ed, can you click the slide? Did we lock up? Um, no, I still have control of it. Am I, are we too far or do we need to go back? No, no, I just need, uh, it won't allow me to click the next slide. I okay. don't know what happened. So the Smart Procure system is a proprietary data set. Oh, it looks like it's a lost connection. So it's a proprietary data set that allows your sales and marketing folks to focus on exactly which agencies are buying what you sell. You can actually see all of your competitors and who they work with. And they actually, we enable you to increase your win percentage for your bids and RFPs between 7 and 12 percent. So that's really the focus of our, the, the goal of the data set is to let you be more functional uh, in exactly what you're doing. Oh, there you go. Looks like we're back. Sorry. So on this slide, I don't know if folks should see, it looks like the, actually the GoToMeeting connection actually went down. So that's the focus of the Smart Procure solution. We have an acronym we call PRISM, right? We wouldn't be a, a company if we didn't have some acronym to go along with kind of how you would work with our system. So those really encompass the following. It really is to prospect, and that's easy to say. Everybody wants a prospect. But most folks, as they go out to find government business, they go down to City Hall and they say, hey, are you guys going to have any bids and RFPs coming out? Can I share my information with you? That's really, really challenging to do at scale, particularly in the state and local marketplace. And so what we like to do is say to folks, hey, we're going to show you everyone that's already buying your stuff. So it's way easier. In the word of sales, there's this thing of, hey, let me change somebody from a no to a yes. Let me, let me, if they're not buying my product, let me have them buy it. That is very, very, very difficult. If someone's not buying iPads today, it's very hard to convince them to say, oh, iPad's a great platform. However, if they're buying iPads and they've bought 1,000 and they're about to buy 100,000 over the next two years, much easier to have them change vendors and uh, consider your company that is to have them start buying net new. So the focus of our system is to say, hey, who's buying what you're selling? Who are they using today if it's not you? And tell you exactly what price they've paid recently. The second is to be able, the, ability, the ability to research, to analyze competitors and know everything that's happening in the market. So with the Smart Procure database, you're able to see literally everything an agency's purchased. You can see the price they've paid. You can see the quantities because at a state and local level, they share that information. They show you the exact price, believe it or not. You can follow the trends. Hey, are they buying more of this item? Are they buying less of this item? And you can see, hey, have they used the same vendor over the last four or five years? That's a very different competitive environment that they've changed vendors every other year, right? So as you consider doing business with a particular agency, you have some sense of what they've done before you arrive. The third component, obviously, is selling. And so very similar to the private sector, the government market is really based upon relationships. And really knowing who to speak to at a particular agency is so, so important because a lot of folks just call and say, hey, we sell widgets. Are you guys buying widgets? When's the last time you bought widgets? Would our widgets be of interest to you? We change the narrative of that conversation. So imagine being able to call a organization, a government entity, and talking to their procurement folks or talking to a function area and being able to say, hey, I know you're buying X. I know you're buying it from this company and we offer that same product or a similar product and, and then relay your value proposition, right? Hey, we are of a cheaper price. We have a better warranty. We have a new way we do it. We can help you be more efficient. So 
you can get rid of all those kind of 50 questions about, hey, would you buy my stuff? Will you look at it? It's a, a much cleaner way to do it. And then the fourth part, the ability to monitor. So in our system, you can actually see all of your customers and exactly uh, if they decide to do business with someone else, you know them immediately. You're actually notified. So that's what our system does. It's an online database. It gives you a ton of information and results. It's almost like cheating in the marketplace. It lets you know the pricing and the volumes and all those things. Here is our website. If you want to go on and uh, kind of see it, you can actually live. We'll go search for your company, your competitors. You can see it in a live environment. It's not a canned demo. For the folks on the call, if you're interested in the product, we're actually doing a buy one, get one free promo before the end of the year. So if you get a license, a username, we actually give you a second one for free. And uh, so you can reach out. Uh, the website's there. And then finally, there's my contact information. So uh, with that said, I will turn it over to Ed. Thanks, Jack. Um, that's, this is the, actually the first time I've actually heard you talk directly about the product, and I can see where that would really fit in with some of my clients, uh, because you're getting right down on the ground, especially at the state and local level, which is really hard to get that information um, any other way. You have to really scrape the websites and then go into uh, databases in order to get that information. So I think I want to take you up on a trial offer of that. Uh, I'm going to talk about key performance indicators for business development. So I'm going to step into pipeline management, what to do once you've identified opportunities to manage those, that pipeline of opportunities so that you can meet financial goals. And there's a relationship between the amount of opportunities you want to go after and your revenue goals. And those are the key performance indicators that bring you from one to the other. Uh, in a lot of ways, if you've got a good set of systems in place, if you have good technology or good services, uh, then it's, it's, that, it's that relationship and those key performance measures that really determine whether you're going to be successful or not. In a, in a way, it's almost just arithmetic. If there's time, I'll go through some, con some common proposal preparation mistakes and some tips here. So we'll be moving from identifying the, the um, the places that are spending money in your area, which is what Jimmy covers, how to auger down more deeply, especially at the state and local level, but also at the federal level, which is what Jack uh, is talking about. And I'm going to pick that up from there and move it into pipeline management and into the beginning of getting ready to write clear, concise, compelling proposals. Because in the end, if you've identified the opportunities, but you're not in a position to bid effectively, turn out winning proposals, uh, you're going to lose anyway. So there's lots of ways to lose. Uh, there's actually only one way to win, and that's to get all of the information, all of the competitive information, put that into a framework that you can make uh, informed bid decisions on. Um, sometimes people look at me and say, well, why should I listen to you? And that, I think the reason is I've got a great track record for winning, and here's just a, some of the stuff that I've been working on for clients. As I said in the beginning, I turned, I, I, I turned to, from managing programs, managing uh, government contracting companies and divisions to providing services to government contractors. So I don't always go lead proposal efforts, but when I do or I leave strategic planning efforts, the result is usually pretty good because I pay attention to the right, to the right information. Who's buying what so we don't go after em empty bags? What's it going to take to win? Uh, what's the competition like? Um, and what do we need to do to turn out that clear, concise, compelling proposals that are meeting all of those goals that Jimmy talked about, which are what are the client's needs and how are we going to meet them better than the competition does. Before I get into the actual performance measures, I want you to take a test, and I don't want you to do it here, but I'm going to, I'm going to write down 11 critical questions that I want you to ask whether or not your organization is doing these things or has a way to do these things. If you do, then you're a very well-scaled organization and you should be very competitive against the most effective firms in your business. If not, you're going to walk away here with a punch list of things that you ought to be spending more time on in order to get yourself in a position where you are much more competitive. The first are the key performance indicators. Do you have some indicators to measure the health of your of your business development program? I'm going to talk to you about the ones that I use and that I use with clients to improve their program. Do you have a way for leads to keep lang 
keep from languishing on the bid list. And what I mean by that is when the RFP comes out, are you truly ready or are you still running around trying to collect information because you didn't get started early enough or there wasn't clear enough direction to the capture team so that you are really ready to go when that request for proposal does come out. Do you know how to st establish a meaningful bid list? Not just a list of opportunities, but a list of ones that I say are meaningful because you're in a position to be competitive and with a good focus on them, you should be in a position to win them, or at least among the leaders, which increases your win rates. Do you know how to, do you know how to scale your opportunities, manage your resources, so that you're not going after too many opportunities and spread too thin or too few so that you don't meet your goals. In the first case, you'd be spreading yourself so thin that your win rates are going to go down. Um, and in the second case, you're not going to be going up against enough, uh, uh, going after enough opportunities to have a chance to meet those financial goals. And there's several more here, and I'm just going to, we're going to send out the the slides at the end, and I really like you to, to read these all carefully and just answer yes or no as to whether or not you have a system in place that addresses each of these. If you don't, that's a good good place to focus on, uh, because if you do that, you you'll you'll increase your win rates because you have to, because you'll be more competitive, because you'll be focusing on the right information to make really truly informed bid decisions, and there are 11 of them on there. If you go up to the ERS Advisors website, which is down at the bottom of the page, ersadvisors.com, you'll see more information about these 11 items. These are really the critical items that separate the organizations that are true leaders in the field that win consistently regardless of what's happening in a large extent, to a large extent with the federal budget uh, from those that are just average players or, or ones that are are well behind the leaders. There's not much difference between uh, an industry leader and a successful firm in terms of the shape of the revenue cur curve. It's a step function. Um, you win a contract uh, um, and then you grow it out and then hopefully you don't lose the recompete and you win another contract and you grow it out and so forth. So it's really a step function if you're a successful organization. The difference between the organization that's successful and the industry leader is merely that the treads are short and the risers are steep, which really only means that the organizations are bidding and winning more often. The key performance indicators that I talk about here put you in a position to have a steep tread, a short tread and a steep riser. Here, here are the performance measures that I use, and they're all pretty well scaled, which means I have benchmarks for each one of them. These are the vital signs, the temperature, the, the lung capacity, the blood pressure, the, the uh, heart rate um, of your business acquisition program. And I would maintain that these are actually the key performance indicators for the health of your business overall. The first one is firm contract backlog. And that's the sum of all of the business you know is coming in through your current efforts, your current contracts, even if, they're the, con even if the funding is not obligated. I'm looking at key performance indicators from a marketing standpoint rather than an accounting standpoint. So I'm not looking at only things that, I, that have been documented that are coming into the, co into the company, but things that I know are coming in from a, a, from a client relationship standpoint based on past history. And firm contract backlog is a measure of the urgency of your business acquisition program. A measure of the stability is the qualified leads backlog, which is the sum of the revenue expected from the proposals that have been submitted. If those proposals have gone through a systematic adjudication process, so the ones that have low win probabilities are weeded out early and you focus your attention just on those opportunities that you have a high probability of winning. Pipeline management to a large extent is that winnowing process where you're making very early no bid decisions based on competitive information so that you can take those dollars that you didn't waste on losing opportunities and redeploy them on opportunities where the where the win percentage, your likelihood of winning is much higher, and that's what I mean by qualified proposal backlog and qualified leads backlog. Qualified leads backlog are the sum of the opportunities in the bids that are on your list, the opportunities that are, that are on your list, 
and they're an indicator of marketplace vitality, not about your business process, but about whether or not there's enough act activity going on with known clients for services that you have. If it turns out you have a very good business identification system, um, you work with Smart Procure, for example, and you can get a really strong list of opportunities together if they're there, and it turns out you can't find any, it's time to either change your services or look for new for new clients, and that's what I mean by marketplace vitality. And finally, sales efficiency, which I'm not going to talk about here, uh, which is just a return on investment, and, and that just tells you whether or not you're using your dollars efficiently or not. I do have some good benchmarks for those, and I don't think I included that slide, but uh, I could be wrong. So here's what I mean by firm contract backlog. It's revenue from dependable sources, and here I've made up two companies, one I call the Ferantic Company, and you can see that its firm contract backlog is dropping off, and the Relax Company, where its firm contract black backlog is coming down much more slowly, it's in a much earlier cycle um, of its contracts, if we're talking about companies that, that are in, say, the federal marketplace, uh, where, where you're working on longer term, multi-million dollar or multi-hundred thousand dollar contracts or task orders. These curves don't look that much different for state and local governments, but they probably do tighten up quite a lot because your, your, your windows of opportunities are, are much shorter. So firm contract backlog is a measure of what you've got in your refrigerator and what you've got in your freezer to pay your bills and keep your staff um, busy. The frantic company is in bad shape and the relaxed company looks like it's whistling Dixie to the bank here because it's got a, it's got a good platform um, to expand from whereas the frantic company is worrying about paying its bills um, and it's got to be really selling maybe discounting and doing a lot of things just to keep revenue flowing. Let me give you an example and I'm going to be quantitative here on how to use these measures and why they're important. So let's assume we have a company I'll call it Federal Consulting Group say it's predominantly a multi-year task order, works on multi-year task order contracts, so it's probably a federal contractor, could be a state contractor, not likely local. The um, performance measures here would still be the same, but the benchmarks would be different for firms that primarily uh, work with local governments. And let's assume its current revenue is $10 million. It has a growth rate of 20% a year. That would mean, and I put these slides together um, actually a while ago. The, um, I should change the dates, but the numbers wouldn't change. So in, in the first year, it's, it's 10 million. The second year, 20% would be 12 million, then 14.4 and so forth. Until you're at 24 million at the end of five years, pretty darn good growth rate from 10 million up to 24 million. Um, if you could grow 20% a year, that would be an amazing result. And actually at SAIC, when I was there, and I was there uh, almost 15 years, we did grow um, 20 percent a year except for those years we grew 30 percent and that's because the systems in place were really excellent. So let me just operationalize th this um, just a bit and let's assume that this 10 million dollar a year contractor has four customers and in the first year um, the revenues are, are coming from these sources and it looks like it's going to increase for a while with EPA and then drop off so it's in the early stages of, an, of a new contract for the Department of Defense, it looks like it's in the middle of a contract that the revenues are stable, then it drops off the last year, and then so forth. And you can see that in 2008, our firm contract backlog is 10 million, it goes up to 11, and then it's a 10, then it starts to drop off. And if I sum those numbers up, that's the firm con that's the um, that would be the firm contract backlog for the organization. And I like to use a benchmark of five times revenue as a good standard for a firm that meets the criteria of, of the, of federal, of the federal, um, federal sources. Um, it's a, it's a multi, it, it goes after multi-year task order contracts and five times revenue is a pretty good number. Um, I've got a disclaimer down here that these guidelines are for illustration purposes only may not apply to your business, but if your business is multi-year uh, task order contracts, uh, then five is not a bad number. If you have a different revenue profile, then that benchmark is going to change. But there is a benchmark that does work that gives you a healthy backlog from contract backlog for your business area. 
But you can see that if I add these numbers up, the 10 and the 11 and the 7 and so forth, I only get to 30 million, which isn't 50 million. Um, it's actually only three times revenue, which is much less than our goal. It's $20 million short. And this is why firm contract backlog is a measure of urgency. In order to fill that gap, just to get even, um, I've got to find $20 million here to have, a, to have a, a healthy firm contract backlog. Let me just continue to move on and define a second um, measure, uh, qualified proposal backlog. And then I'm going to put this all together and show you how to use them um, as a group. So what's a qualified proposal? Qualified proposal is one that's well re researched with compelling themes. In other words, you've done your homework. You've vetted it with the client. Um, and it's the sum of the submitted bids discounted to reflect customer budgets. Those of you that are federal contractors, you know very often the advertised ceiling on a contract is not the budget that the client has. So that's part of your due diligence and vetting with the client. Um, and your win rate history is also important here. Uh, which is why the fifth measure in terms of efficiency is really important. You want to get your win rates up, and one way to do that is to no-bid opportunities early that based on good, solid, competitive information, you're not in the ballgame to win. You're not writing flyers. You're only investing in high probability uh, proposals, opportunities, in which you've followed all the rules that Jimmy talked about, uh, identified good opportunities that, like Jack talked about, and follow a discipline process like I'm talking about right here. And a reasonable backlog for, for federal would be four times revenue, although with the internet and the reduction in costs for, um, th that's taken place over the last several years um, because of the internet and automated, much more automated ways to write proposals, that could be a high number for some companies, but, it, but it's through conversations and through some triaging, it's not that hard to tease out what that real number, number should be. And what did I mean here? So this should get you to a pretty high win rate because you're not bidding flyers. And I'm not talking about recompetes in this, too. I want to talk about new business coming into the organization. So let me show you how you calculate qualified proposal backlog. So let's assume that these are the submitted proposals for the organization. It's submitted a total of $40 million in opportunities, and I want to know whether that's enough or not for it to meet its goals. The period of performance is five years, and let's say we've discounted the, the, the client budgets by these numbers. Um, we know going forward through sequestration and other things that advertised budgets and real budgets are not going to be the same. Um, we, we put a win rate uh, in here based on the maturity of the pursuit of that opportunity. That's another training. Uh, we don't have time to go through that there, but why why 75 percent and not 30 percent? Uh, that has to do with how well you've done your due diligence on the opportunity. And then the expected value from that opportunity is just the proposal price times the discounted uh, budget times the win rate, and I get 2537 and so forth. If I add all that up, I get $12 million here. So let me see whether this is enough to meet my financial goal. Remember that our revenue projection at 20% was going to yield these numbers. This is what the company wants to do, which means over that five-year period, it wants to generate $90 million in revenue. But its contract backlog, if you remember from the previous chart, is only $30 million. There's a $60 million gap. If it were to bid $40 million a year with these discount figures, it would generate $12 million a year. Well, 12 into the $60 million that it's looking for equals $12 million, so those numbers work. So four times revenue for a company that has these ki facing these kinds of parameters is a number that works. And, what I, and I, I illustrate this not to show you that my arithmetic is pretty good, because um, it isn't always. Uh, but the point is that there is a benchmark number that tells you whether you've got a healthy business acquisition program or not. And if you, if you use those numbers, uh, you're able to, to, to allocate your resources in a way where you have a high probability of winning, of meeting your revenue goals over time and, and, winning your, and, and meeting your growth rates. 
So this is a measure of stability because if you do have th this level in your backlog, then the company really is in good shape. Okay, let me just move move a little bit more quickly here um, and just, just show you what these things mean. So qualify, I'm sorry, let me just move, let me just run through qualified leads backlog very, very quickly. And that's the sum of the opportunities that are on your bid list. And six times current revenue is not a bad number there because about one third won't be bid anyway. And a plentiful list indicates a healthy market, as I explained before, and a weak list means that you probably want to diversify either services or marketplace so that if, there, if you're a fisherman and there are no fish, it's probably time to turn to another source of revenue, maybe farming. Uh, oh, I do have a slide here on sales efficiency. I'm going to let, just let you read that. But um, what, I'm, what I'm looking here is looking for sales efficiency guidelines, and one of about a, a return on investment of about 110 to 1 is a pretty healthy one for, for markets in the federal marketplace. If you're in other markets, um, that number could be different. But the point is that there is a number that indicates you do have an effective and efficient uh, business acquisition program. If this number drops to 25 or 30 to 1, then I would want to look at your decision-making processes, how you're getting information, whether it's correct information, how you're using that information in order to make informed bid decisions. So these key performance indicators are important, they're effective, and they are what separate the industry leaders from the firms that are uh, just the average firms in the field. So how do you use them? Firm contract backlog measures urgency, qualified proposal backlog measures stability, Qualified leads backlog measures the vitality and the sales efficiency measures the return on investment. So just putting this all together very quickly, the relaxed company versus the frantic company just will remind you what that is. Um, but if we take a look at this all together, which profile is better? The relaxed company and the, and the frantic company each start out with revenues of 10 million. But remember, the relaxed company has a much better firm contract backlog, does that mean the company is in a better position than the frantic company? Well, what if the qualified proposal backlog for the seemingly poor com poorly positioned company is much bigger than the relaxed company? In other words, it's got, a, it's, got, it's got a lot of stability there. It could be that its recompetes are coming up, and that's why its firm contract backlog looks low. But more importantly, it's in a vital market and the relaxed company is not in a vital market. It's actually in trouble, even though it's short term. The next couple of years, its revenues look okay. It doesn't have enough of an, its backlog pipeline to fill in the gap between current revenues and, the, and, and its drop, and it doesn't have enough in its qualified leads backlog to grow. So which would you rather be? I think I'd rather be the frantic company. Actually, I'd rather be the frantic company with the firm contract backlog of the relaxed company. But I think you can see that you've got to look at these key performance measures as a group. And as a group, they really tell a story like I just did for those two companies. So low firm contract backlog means you focus on proposals. Qualified backlog means you focus on more leads. Low qualified leads backlog means you've got to diversify and low sales efficiency means you've got to focus on the decision processes and that's how you use those uh, those measures um, I did talk I did say I would talk about um, proposal tips and I'm only going to spend a couple of minutes on this and this is the whole life cycle of a capture and proposal program and the areas that I've got in this whitish background here, the areas that I find many companies and maybe most companies don't do a particularly good job. And and if I if I say that, that's sort of bad news in a way, except it's not, it's really good news. And I work with a lot of different companies. There's a lot of areas in which they fall down. And if your company doesn't have a good way to, to capture its information and get it into written form to be ready for that proposal, all the competitive information, if it doesn't focus on what the program plan is for the proposal, what the compliance needs to be for the proposal, how to get everything together in a good annotated outline uh, based on storyboarding, if you don't take the, the, the drafts, the drafts uh, seriously so that you get a red team that can be scored, look at the areas of improvement 
and since a lot of firms are not good at those areas, you only have to get better in a couple of them, and you're going to you're going to really increase your your sales, uh, your, your your return on investment, um, really pretty dramatically. Let me just move on quickly. Building the bid library is really important, and that's what I was talking about in the top. You want, you want to distill all of that information so that it's usable in the proposal. Many firms collect a tremendous amount of information about the competition, about the opportunity, um, but they never get it into a form that's easy to use in the proposal. Therefore, it ends up in folders and not in the proposal. Your win rate goes down. Um, proposal readiness is all about getting yourself in front of the client with the techniques that Jimmy talked about um, so that you understand exactly how to move forward but also getting everything together in one place so that you're ready for the for the opportunity you're ready to write that proposal when the RFP comes out and you're not scarring around still collecting competitive information differentiators, teaming, all of that positioning information. If, and if you do have all of that positioning information, it's expensive to get it. So you want to make sure that the company is ready to write a good proposal and to use all of this information, not just collect it, so that all of these things are done near the end of the capture or right in the first week or, or, or week or less of the or, after the RP is issued but the single most important thing to do to, to prove that you're ready to write that proposal is to write a clear concise compelling executive summary which means you've taken into consideration all of these things all of this information is in there um, and if if the proposal lead can't do that write a clear concise compelling executive summary uh, it's not likely that they can do that in the proposal either. So after spending all of this money, you need some tests here to make sure that that money is well, uh, well spent, so that you're not just ready for the RFP, you're not just positioned for the for the with the client, but you're also ready for the RFP. Um, I'm going to let you read this part yourself. Proposals tell stories. Um, it's by a very experienced marketer, Chris Simmons from Rainmakers consulting I just said I just think he says this really well about how to write compelling stories um, in ways that the uh, client really understands what you're telling them that you've got your solutions clear and it puts all of the sections together um, so that so that there's no question that you are the firm to beat here it's really telling a story and firms that don't tell good stories uh, usually don't win as often um, as ones that do Okay, so I moved through that really uh, quickly. In the slideshow, you'll see some of the stuff that I do in terms of helping firms actually win. And with that, I think we can go back to Jimmy and talk about creating the right unique selling proposition. Thanks a lot, Ed. Folks, uh, we're just a few minutes away from taking your questions where Jack, uh, myself, and Ed would be happy to answer any question you have. I know we're at the top of the hour, and we'll be happy to stay a few extra minutes. I've tried to respond back to uh, a lot of the questions that you all have uh, online, but we're going to talk something right, talk about something right now that's critical, and it's where a lot of people make mistakes at the end of the day. And um, what I want to talk to you about is there's a there's a lot of misnomers in the government space. Uh, for a lot of clients, I actually do a branding audit for them where I go out and interview their team, their government customers, and sometimes what happens, and I'm a sales guy, I'm enthusiastic, I'm in marketing, is we begin to believe what we're saying about ourselves, but we never actually test it with the target customer. We don't, you know, in government it's really hard to do a focus group, but we never validate, validate what we're selling and talk about, whether you're selling cloud solutions or uh, you know tractors. A lot of times you might think what you have is great, but you don't sell it that way. The other thing that we're going to quickly talk about is within any department, state, local, federal, there's generally 15 to 30 vertical markets. One of the biggest mistakes that people make when they're calling into the government after they've done all this budget research and they're getting ready is they haven't identified for them how a solution fixes a vertical. And I want you to think about this. The government, um, uh, they uh, provide health care. 
They provide transportation, logistics. So it's not about you selling a product. It's how you enhance, improve savings in whatever that vertical is. There's a chart here up on your screen. Uh, the bottom line with this is why you and what do you really do for them. I recently, I host uh, an independent fault leadership forum called the Public Sector Technology Exchange. And in a recent conversation, I, I had a uh, high up person within the California Department of Transportation um, say to our audience of both government and industry, what they're tired at in government is they don't want you coming anymore with government best practice. Everyone knows that government lags behind a bit. They want to know what is industry best practice, where it's improving things, and how they can take those savings and literally apply them to other projects. So here's the deal. If you're getting ready to write a proposal, if you're getting ready to sell a solution, make sure that you have validated what you say you do with the information review, review board of people that do it. I have sat in many of Pink Team reviews where I hear Mark, you know, Redrick, oh, we think we're number two in this, or three, we're going to do this. And I've raised my hand, did you ever validate? And the answer is no. That is dangerous. You've got to validate it. Make sure you have a business case associated with it. A business case will typically show an improvement in a process or an hour savings of how you help someone. Uh, I outline this in detail in my book. It's something that you can look at. The other thing I want to quickly talk about and I'm, is who the government buyer is. We live in this age, and I use social media. I've been posting while well, this webinar is going on on Facebook and LinkedIn, what it's doing. But what you have to be mindful of as a, as a person selling to the government is that according to the Office of Personnel Management, um, these are the stats on your screen. The average age is about 54. So what that's telling you is a 54-year-old may be more likely to download your white paper than follow you on Twitter. And I know that you know there's been a lot going on in this world of uh, everyone trying to keep up to pace with what's going on with Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, there's a variety of networks that I'm in. And what I'm saying is that you really have to understand whom you're targeting and how they interact and download information. This isn't my opinion. It's stats from the Office of Personal Management. But look at the statistics of someone who is 54 today. Uh, this is I'm in my mid-40s. This is the generation a little bit older than I am. But look at how they would look at things. And what you've got to remember, if you're trying to convince that person of your services and what you do, you might have to approach them in a way that they would understand it more. Bottom line, they still use email. They hear voicemails. They will read a white paper. They might look at other things in social media, but those are very important things. Last thing I want to share with you all, um, I remember as a young salesperson, I went to the Tom Hopkins uh, training course. And he drew, he drew up this picture up on the screen. It was of two half lines, and it said, the best way to communicate with your client is to get belly to belly with them. And that hasn't changed in uh, 25 years. And this is a, uh, not my opinion, but something from uh, the Marketing Institute where they show that what we're finding when your marketing people create information to tell your target market about what you do is that customer facing events are still the best way to do things. Then webinars. And what I'm saying to you all is that when your company, at the end of the day, decides that um, you go through the information that we've done in this webinar, you look at the budget, you use the JAC system to uh, figure out a way to, excuse the pun, smart procure something, you're up to board on all the things Ed's talking about, and at the end of the day, your marketing team has a mission to create a brand, a message that says, we do this for this demographic better, and you want to make sure that your information resonates this. I'm going to close with a story just to show you this. And pay attention to this information on the screen. Like I said, um, I could go an hour on this, what I won't. But your words and your phrases are really important. Several years ago, I was speaking in the great state of Atlanta uh, to a uh, seminar that I was doing for the Small Business Administration. At the end of the forum, uh, I asked if there were any questions, and a person in the back of the room raised her hand, and this woman said that she was there to audit me from the government. And th those aren't words you really want to hear, audit and government. But anyway, this wonderful person went on to say to my audience, she said, if you all would take time 
to do half the stuff that this gentleman is telling you. We'd be more willing to listen to you. And it's, it's a bottom line communication problem. People market what they think you want to know, but they don't take time to validate it. So there's ways of doing this. It's quite a bit of information we've gone over today. But again, I want to um, you know, make the point that it's really important to focus a single message. And if your company is going to go after five deals this year, make sure your senior management, your people on the floor, your emails, your marketing rhetoric, your website, the colors image, your social posts, your white papers, everything supports that information that you're going to go chase. Harder, easier said, harder done. Now, we uh, are right at the hour that we promised for the webinar. I know some of you, uh, we've gotten a few questions coming in. I know there's a couple for Jack. Um, actually, to actually, Jimmy, we, uh, we schedule this for an hour and 15 minutes, so I think we're oh, still great. true, true so, to our work. You mean I'm early for a change? I think we've got to mark this as an historic event because I'm always running behind. So what I would like to do is um, – open up right now. You can use the chat feature, uh, the dashboard on your screen. Actually, the and question, the question box is where to put the questions. And uh, there's several in there now. Great. Why don't we, uh, Ed, why don't you go ahead and field those out and we'll uh, take them one at a time. Okay. It's the first I've looked at them. Let's see. Big ticket items usually have an, an, an incumbent associated with the development project in a phased effort, so, they're, so these are not competitive for the majority of the contractors working on work, this, looking for work. That isn't actually a question, um, but it is a good observation. Um, Jimmy, what's your experience there about whether things move from one phase to another and it's really not competitive in, in some procurements? Well, um, yeah, that, it, it, it's a great question, whoever asked it, but it's, it's it's more of a complex sell, so let me, uh, and you can call me outside of this, we can talk in more detail about it. Um, I had a, let me just tell you in a story in a moment. I had a Canadian client uh, that wanted to get into the Department of Homeland Security. In a large three-letter acronym system integrator ran that contract. They had the contract awarded, it was ongoing. After we studied that this incumbent had this contract, we saw an area after looking at the budgets, looking at all the strategy. Um, I also read a lot of Office of Inspector General reports to understand where there are weaknesses in a program. You read the business case. We founded something that they needed an improvement with that this company uniquely offered. So back to your question. You've got to approach a company why, uh, very wisely, but you can get into a deal. But here's how you do it. So long story short, I would never start barking up the tree of an incumbent. I would go directly to the end user, and I would get them to identify and understand what you offer. If that conversation goes well traditionally, they will tell you to go to the program manager of that integrator or whomever owns that contract, and they can add you on. And we can talk about that offline. It's but back to what, and I, I want to make sure that uh, the question's clear and, uh, and what this person's saying is, hey, there are a lot of contracts out there or GWACs that are in place and, you know, I can't get in on them. Well, you can get added in. It's, a, it's, it is a, it's, it's more of a complex sale. I, I definitely wouldn't have your junior level folks working on it. But you can absolutely get added on at the end of the day if you're able to show value. And I, I can't tell you throughout my career how many times I have gone and got add, either added on or I've sold something uh, unsolicited but I've, where I've shown value to the government. And I, um, we could talk about this offline, uh, how that works when you're you know, going through an integrator. Um, you always got to remember none of them are in business to give it away. But if their customer says to them, use these people, uh, they're going to do it. And that becomes the focus of your sale. Good advice. Jack, here's a question I'm going to throw in your direction. Can the model be used to, uh, for agriculture and professional landscaping markets? We are an equipment dealer. So how well does the tool work uh, outside of the IT market? Yeah, so the nice part about Smart Procure, it literally summarizes every agency's spending and all of their spending. So it capitalizes every, or captures everything from a P card purchase all the way up to their most complex RFP. And it runs the gamut in all industries, so whether that's when they're buying pencils or whether they're buying a cloud-based server, or whether they're buying landscaping, or whether they're buying guns for the police department. So 
literally you'll see all of an organizational spending regardless of dollars. So no matter what you sell or, or what widget you have or even if it's a service, you can go in and compare apples to apples. Yes, So, and the answer is yes, it's not just IT, it's whatever's being bought, you're going to capture that. Here, here's a little more refined question about hotels, and I've never actually done anything with hotels. Do you find, do you find the purchasing of hotels, bulk purchasing, maybe, um, uh, tr maybe, tr maybe broaden this to travel just a little bit? Do you find travel in there too? Yeah. So in the smart facility system, there's anything, literally. So for government agencies that are using either hotels for their people to travel, or if they have a relationship with a local hotel because of visitors or events that they're utilizing. So in our system, we work with a lot of travel-related companies, including hotels, to figure out what government organizations they're working with, and then, again, what the rates are they offering across the board. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of hotels offer government rates. Um, but I bet if I bet if you were to narrow down some contract officers that are procuring travel services, you might go in there and make a pitch about a special rate, a special bulk buy rate um, across the government. And I don't know that any of the major hotels or even local hotels in certain cities have ever done that. But I bet it's an argument that would probably sell. Sure. Yeah. And, yeah, and I think the hospitality vertical. I mean, when you when you look at like Department of Defense, they have that. Uh, there's so much travel that goes on. I mean, that's absolutely a vertical that exists in government. Yes, that's right. Hospitality is a is a big yeah is a big deal. Just just not my area. Well, here's one that I think is a really a good question from Dale. Um, since walking the halls is much more limited today, no badge, no access. What do you recommend strategies to get to uh, one get an ID and see the appropriate program people? Um, or ID and see the pro pro program people, ID the review board, in particular people who do not like to meet vendors. You know, it did used to be a lot easier to get inside an agency. You could just use your license and walk the halls. Now you can't do that. So, Jimmy, what do you do? It's a great uh, question, and I, I'm someone that uh, I spend a lot of time uh, with a lot of my clients cold calling, believe it or not. Here, here's why a government person doesn't want to meet meet with you, it's generally this, you've not demonstrated your value proposition. And so many times they get, uh, and I, I meet with a lot of retired government people, they get the standard line. So here, that, that's the big thing. And sometimes you're trying to do it and they're not able to listen to you, or maybe they're in a blackout period. Let me talk to you a little bit about how to, how to get into an agency. And I'm going to share another story, uh, but I think it'll really make the point home. In today's world of government, um, I do more virtual whiteboards. Um, I work through scheduling assistance, sending over agendas, and I clearly articulate the value proposition and meeting agenda. Now, I want to go back with you. When I was talking about when you're setting up your run rate, remember I had that slide where I said you got to add all these columns? At the end of the day, if you go through my methodology that I lay out in the book, it, it, the idea is that you're able to say, hey, government agency, you have this mission, mandate, and goal to do X, Y, Z. My company does ABC, and we can help you improve your process by doing this. By the way, I know you have an RFP, and it's coming out. Now, many times when I call into government, I will get someone who, um, who refuses to talk to me or says I can't speak. And I'll have to say to them, there's a lot of objections that come out when you're cold calling. And I'll have to say to them, well, please help me understand that when, you know, secretary so-and-so mandates this and so-and-so says to do this, why you wouldn't want to talk to me about this. And a lot of times you have to be more informed than they are about the, what's going on in their groups. Um, I recently worked with a client who wanted to get access to the VA. And what we ended up finding is after going through their entire organization, there was a hub, uh, uh, there was a group of decision makers out of uh, Eatontown, New Jersey. How we got a physical presentation with their entire team is I had to do a lot of cold calling. Um, I did a lot of virtual presentations. It was a, uh, it was a, it was actually a company that sold mobile applications for government. We had to demonstrate a bunch of stuff to people all over the country. When we went through that, they brought us in for an hour and a half meeting. So 
Um, yeah, there was a time when it was a little bit easier. It's harder now. Streamline, send an agenda, make it unbelievably clear why they should be talking to you and how it ultimately enhances their budget and their mission goals. The other thing that I, I want to give you all as a really good takeaway technique is um, read the GAO, Government Accountability, and OIG reports. A lot of times you can find problems to fix. I'm going to share with you a quick story now. I was working with a client that was just a, a standard systems integrator in Northern Virginia. They had no business in the Department of Census in the sense that they just had, they had solutions they wanted, but just hadn't sold anything in there. They wanted to get into Census, so they hired me to you know, go through the budgets, create run rates. We came across this problem by reading an OIG report that there was an issue with their security. Um, I tracked down the person in charge of that through just knowing the organization, reading some business cases, and I called him up. And when I got this gentleman on the phone, and it was no easy task, I had to be persistent. When I got, finally got him on the phone, my comment to him is I said, sir, I've read the OIG report, and I don't believe it's true. Uh, at that moment, he loved me because he had taken some bad press on this. And he said, you're right, this is what the real issue is. I said, I am working with a client that can fix this, and we want to come in and meet with you. Uh, would you be able to give us 15 minutes? We won't need more. So long story short, um, I went back to my client. They were excited. It took me four months to get the meeting. Uh, the client was simply busy. It was about this time of the year. We met with them right before Christmas break. The day of the meeting, uh, this particular client I was dealing with was very bright. They understood the power of first impressions and knew they would not have another shot. The president of the company literally said, this weekend, we are going to be preparing the best message to get this guy's attention. We walked in the door. There were three of us. We sat down with this chief information security officer. And on his desk, we rolled out a two-foot by three-foot laminate. And on that laminate were two yellow circles. Those yellow circles indicated where he was having problems. He looked at our laminate, and we had our, again, we had myself, the president of the company, and our best security guy there. He looked at the laminate, and he said, you all understand my problem. I want to put this up in my office, and I want to share it with my other team members. Now, after the president of the company fell, about fell over, because uh, you don't get advertising like that uh, in any place, we went on to a discussion with this person about how he could get to us, and the client ended up doing about a million-dollar deal through GSA. I make that sound real easy. It was a hard thing. But the point is, fundamental selling is interest bearing on a need. How do I show you how I fix something? Um, I get hung up on. I get people that don't return my calls, and I will tell you it's persistence and constantly defining your value. They don't care about your size who you are, what they really care about is how you fix something and where you can show value to them in another area. Um, I've had that repeated to me by countless government people that I meet with. That's what they're looking for, and sometimes it's really hard. And like I said, the higher up someone is, they will have an administrative executive, and I typically, when I start cold calling into an agency for a client, I will find that AE and I will develop a nice rapport with them, and I'll say so-and-so. Um, I want to know what the most appropriate way is to get on you know, John Doe's schedule. I have a strong value proposition for him. We're doing this with these commercial companies, and I think we can help them here in this problem. Generally, what happens within a government organization is an administrative executive sits down with that key person uh, once every couple days, and they review all the calls and stuff coming in. And that's, that's where a lot of times you can get on the list. So, it's a big answer. It's a very hard question, and just keep changing up your strategy. There's not a one-size-fits-all when you're dealing with objections and trying to get in the door. But with the with, with the last thirty seconds, I have a different answer because I don't make cold cold calls. But I think the analysis, the analytical approach that you're talking can be very effective if you've got a really clear-cut solution that's an advantage over the competitors, and make that. But I, I look for a valid introduction and someone that um, has a good relationship with that client, um, th with that office, maybe from a previous relationship that I have within the government, or maybe another firm, or just an individual. So I, I look for ways to get introduced into that office. That's great advice. 
that in, works a, in, too. in a valid way. So there's lots of ways to skin a cat. It depends upon what the situation is. There's no single right answer to the question, how do you succeed within the government? It depends on the situations. And the tips that we've been talking about here are, are things that you need to consider uh, as you move forward in your government program. This is, that was the last question. We did hit them all. Uh, and we are, are also um, at the at the top of the hour, which is um, pretty efficient on our part, I think. Uh, so, uh, you know, as the last word here, um, we could maybe just, um, Jimmy might just spend one second on the, on the um, public sector technology exchange, and we can close this out. I, I appreciate that, folks. Um, I host a independent Forum. They're open to the public and free to attend. And we try to tackle the issues of government, technology, and the citizen. We've got one coming up in Sacramento on critical mobile government, changing the way California collaborates. I also do forums nationally. You've got my website link there for those of you in California. Come join us. We also have a number of them online. But again, one of the best ways to understand what your government customers' problems are is just to listen to them and come up with a solution. So. Let me uh, say thank you to all of you for chiming in. I do appreciate the opportunity to speak today, and I'll hand things back over to Ed. Great. Thanks, Jimmy. And Jack, thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to be part of this webinar and explain your program and, and, and the um, service. And since we've uh, answered all of the questions, I'm going to uh, just say thank you to the audience for hanging in here right to the end. And almost everyone who started with us is still here, so we appreciate that. And with that, I'm going to close out the session.